Intel's Meteor Lake mobile CPUs have the kind of performance and efficiency that actually bodes well for their next range of desktop chips. However, I've yet to test one with a discrete GPU, so my only experience has been with integrated graphics. Which is fine, but it could be better. Well, thanks to Minis Forum's latest mini PC and a slightly sketchy adapter I picked up on Amazon for 40 quid, I finally have the chance to do something about that. Minus Forum sent me the UH125 Pro for review free of charge, and although I've seen a lot of mini PCs lately, and I guess so have you, this one got me quite excited. Well, okay, maybe the exterior isn't all that exciting. With a no frills, mainly black chassis, the 125H's only real distinguishing feature is that it's a bit larger than a lot of similarly priced mini PCs without being so big as to miss the whole point. Oh, and a dedicated button to activate Copilot, which will probably date this machine horribly in a couple of years' time. The model name obviously refers to its Intel Ultra 5 125H CPU, which is a pretty efficient processor in its own right, and that slightly bigger chassis means that there's room for enough cooling to keep it running at surprisingly low temps. You get a decent range of ports, the usual suspects are here, a smattering of Type A's, a couple of USB 4 Type C's, dual 5 gigabit Ethernet, and even an SD card slot on the side. But what's really exciting to me is this, an Oculink port. This connector, similar in design to DisplayPort, is developed specifically for attaching PCIe devices, like external GPUs, to mobile devices like laptops, handhelds and mini PCs. Oculink is essentially a miniature PCI Express cable, using four lanes of Gen 4 PCIe for up to 64 gigabits per second of bandwidth. Oculink isn't that new, it's been available on a couple of previous models of mini PC as well as some laptops and even handhelds, but this is the first one I've got my hands on, and it's a unit with a current generation CPU. The Core Ultra 5 125H is a Meteor Lake mobile CPU built on the Intel 4 process, with 4 performance cores, 8 efficient cores and 2 low power E cores, 18 megabytes of L3 cache and integrated Arc XE graphics. Naturally I won't be using the iGPU in this video, but I should be able to take advantage of Meteor Lake's higher instructions per clock and lower TDP to help drive a pretty powerful external graphics card. That would be this. I've already published a review of the RTX 3080 Ti a few weeks ago, and I'll leave a link to it at the end of the video. It's not quite world class anymore thanks to its high power consumption and the presence of at least two RTX 30 and three RTX 40 series cards above it in the product stack, as well as the imminent launch of Blackwell GPUs in coming months. However, it's still more than up to the challenge of 1440p ultra gaming in 2024. The important question is, can it be connected to a mini PC without completely neutering its performance? Physically plugging the 3080Ti into the UH125 Pro is reasonably simple. Oculink is really starting to gain a foothold on the wider market, so as well as the smart, polished options like proper eGPU docks and dedicated mobile form factor Radeon units, it's possible to pick up inexpensive DIY solutions that should do the job just as well. I bought this somewhat janky little setup from Amazon for about £40, and for that I got a full length PCIe connector, a short Oculink cable, and an M.2 connector for PCs which don't have an Oculink port on board. Of course, thanks to the UH125 Pro's external port, I don't need the M.2 adapter on this occasion, but I might find a use for it in the future. Enabling the 3080 Ti took a little preparation. Using the integrated graphics, I downloaded the Nvidia drivers, rebooted into the BIOS and made sure the system would prioritise the eGPU. After one more reboot with the external GPU plugged in and switched on, I got a signal out from the GeForce card straight away. And a blue screen asking me to enter a BitLocker key. 
After going to the address on the screen using my phone and obtaining the key, I was back in Windows within minutes, this time with a fully armed and operational RTX graphics card lying on its side like an unfortunate whale. Okay, so it's not an elegant solution, but does it work? Hell yeah, it does. If there's a best case scenario for external GPUs, I'd say it's probably Forza Horizon 5. Plugged into a PCIe slot on an AM5 motherboard and paired up with a Ryzen 5 7500F, the RTX 3080 Ti passes 130 FPS at 1440 Ultra and only loses a dozen frames with all the bells and whistles enabled. Attached to the mini PC via Oculink, there's a significant, but I would argue forgivable, drop in performance. At 1440 Ultra, it can still manage over 100 FPS on average. This is about a 17% drop overall, though 1% lows take a 30% hammering compared to the desktop. The RT test sees averages of 93 and lows of 71. In terms of percentages, that's a 24% loss on average and 31% at the low end. Unfortunately, it's pretty much all downhill from there. Starfield is only borderline on the 3080 Ti at the best of times, with an average of about 66 FPS at 1440 Ultra. On the mini PC, it loses almost 40% of its performance, averaging just under 40 FPS, with lows just over 30. That's not to say you can't get a better result than this by tweaking settings, but there are still limits. Even adding quality DLSS only gives a roughly 10% improvement, most likely due to the relatively weak quad-core CPU holding things back. The GPU appears to be fully loaded, but note that the power consumption drops way below the 350 mark pretty often. Cyberpunk 2077 sees a similar drop in performance compared to a desktop with full X16 slot, with the average dropping from a possible 82 FPS to just 47. While this low average FPS is no doubt due at least in part to the Oculent connector, its absolutely terrible 1% lows are probably due to the Ultra 5 CPU. The GPU is often well below full utilisation, and without wishing to spoil next week's video too much, I recently tested a Thunderbolt dock on an older mobile i9 and it saw similar averages but much healthier percentile lows. The Last of Us makes a triumphant return thanks to the latest driver update. The last two GeForce driver packages have refused to load the game at all, claiming a lack of VRAM. Now that it works, I can tell you that, again, we've lost about 40% performance in translation from internal to external GPU. The 80 plus average is now barely above 50 FPS, and again, some of that's on the CPU. The game is unreasonably demanding on processors, and while a modern desktop quad-core could handle it quite nicely, this mobile version is apparently struggling. I don't have any desktop benchmarks for comparison from these next couple of games, as I don't usually feel they're challenging enough on higher tier graphics cards, and they're definitely more of a benchmark for CPUs than GPUs. The Arc XE graphics are capable of about 90 FPS in Apex Legends on their own. That does of course require some setting sacrifices, but it still looks fine at 1080p low. Adding the RTX 3080 Ti without touching the settings at all more than doubles the frame rate, to the point where it's actually an extremely competitive experience. Probably not as good as you might hope for a card of this calibre and price, and certainly being held back somewhat by the CPU. Increasing resolution as well as pushing settings all the way up to high has less of an impact than you might expect, still holding an average of 140 FPS. Counter-Strike 2 is a pretty decent experience on integrated graphics, coming in at over 100 FPS at 1080 low with FSR disabled. Adding the eGPU makes things so, so much worse. I'm serious, the average climbs by 70%, but 1% lows and 0.1% lows fall through the floor. Weirdly enough, however, trying to ease up on the CPU bottleneck improves things dramatically, and at 1440 very high, the average drops to 156 FPS, but 1% lows are a much more acceptable 72.
I ran most of the synthetics without the eGPU attached, starting with my throttle test in CPU Z. For the first 9 tests, everything seemed pretty smooth, fluctuating less than 100 points from best to worst. The 10th and final test did droop by about 100 points in the multi-core test, which struck me as an anomaly more than anything, and only represents a 1.5% reduction anyway. So far, Meteor Lake has proven far less susceptible to thermal throttling than any of Intel's previous architectures. That's equally visible in Cinebench R23. During the 10 minute test, the first run scored 14,916, and by the end of the 10 minutes, the score had actually climbed by a few points. Not enough to mean anything, but again, I'm used to Intel scores dropping over time, so this is really encouraging. Comparatively speaking, this score is a good 1000 points or so ahead of the last 125H I tested, but still a few hundred points short of the more expensive Ryzen 7 units. In Geekbench 6, the multi-core CPU score is much closer to the other 125H in the GM KTEC unit, which also puts it quite a way below the Ryzen's. Even the Core 7 doesn't do too well in this test, so I think that Intel just have to accept that Geekbench isn't their biggest fan. In the GPU test, the scores of 26K in OpenCL and 27K in Vulkan are about on par with what we'd expect to see. Strapping on the eGPU for a bit of context sees those results increase by a factor of about 7. Once again, I have to mention that the Geekbench ML test doesn't stress the NPU portion of any of the current gen CPUs. However, as the 125H's neural processing unit has reportedly only 10 tops of ML performance, it probably wouldn't contribute all that much anyway. The CPU and GPU scores are both bracketing 3000, which is a fair way short of the Ryzen 7 8845HS. Naturally, in the 3D Mark tests, I include results from both integrated and external graphics. The former does fine in Time Spy, competing with the Radeon 780M, the 3080Ti scores a GPU score of 17.5K, which is a lot, but also about 12% down from the desktop results. In Firestrike, the iGPU is a little more disappointing compared to the competition, and the GeForce loses a whopping 25-30% to compared to the results from the desktop Ryzen test. Blender doesn't normally make it to my GPU tests, and so far nobody's asked me to do so. However, CUDA acceleration is one of the big selling points for NVIDIA GPUs in this software, so I thought it would be interesting to compare and contrast. The 125H can complete the classroom render without a GPU in under 7 minutes. Not quite Ryzen APU levels of performance, but better than even previous generation mobile i9s could manage. The 3080 Ti completes the test in… uh… 23 seconds. The more robust cooling system in the Minus Forum unit means that it completes a 5 minute H.264, H.265 or AV1 render in Resolve faster than the previous Ultra 5 125H I tested, which is in turn faster than previous Gen i9s. The Ryzen's are still a bit faster however. Before I get to a conclusion about the Oculink setup, I want to wrap up on the Minus Forum UH125 Pro. As I've said before, I'm still optimistic about Intel's direction with these new CPUs, especially on the mobile fronts, and I hope the improvements we see here will carry over to the next-gen desktop chips too. Arc graphics might not be the best for gaming, but for media encoding and decoding, it's pretty incredible to have this level of performance on an iGPU. Unfortunately, it appears that the new efficient architecture alone isn't enough for the Ultra 5 to drive the eGPU to high frame rates, or even just normal frame rates much of the time, although this loss of performance isn't entirely the CPU's fault. Perhaps something with a few more performance cores, like maybe the Ultra 7 155H or Ultra 9 185H, would do a better job. The UH125 Pro itself has a few more pros and cons to talk about. The larger size isn't going to be to everyone's tastes, but it's still small enough to be considered a true mini PC, and can still bolt onto the back of a monitor's visa mount if you want to hide it altogether. 
Moreover, whatever downside there might be in its size, the UH125 more than makes up for it with its impressive cooling capability. The fan runs quiet even at full load and is exceptionally effective. Unfortunately, this progress seems to have come at the cost of accessibility. This is by far the least user-friendly mini PC I've come across lately. You need to remove the whole cooling assembly with 12 tiny Phillips screws to get to the user-replaceable parts of the system, and this is really disappointing. The last system Minus Forum sent me was the NAB9, which had a fantastic top cover that opened with a finger press. So to see the same company make something so much harder to work inside is a real step backwards in my opinion. You can buy this system bare bones without RAM or storage, but if you're not handy inside computers, you probably shouldn't. Finally, regarding Oculink. I've steered clear of eGPUs in the past for a couple of reasons. I get that sometimes you need more than a simple mini PC can deliver, and sometimes that means finding ways of adding more GPU horsepower. I've just never been convinced of the practicality of it. I had one brief bad experience with an HP Omen Thunderbolt dock back before I started the channel, and that soured me on Thunderbolt eGPUs in general. Oculink, by comparison, was refreshingly simple, if slightly overcomplicated by the whole BitLocker thing, so maybe I'm warming a bit to this new direction for eGPUs. This might not be the way to go about it, it's not the neatest solution, and if you're going to go down this road, I think it's probably worth spending more than £40 just to get something that holds the graphics card and power supply more securely. I still think most people would be better served by literally anything else. A mini ITX build with a discrete graphics card attached directly to the motherboard, or a laptop with a DGPU, or one of those console-esque PCs that are basically headless laptops. However, for some people this setup makes sense, and it's not important for me to work out why, but to find out if the performance is still there. In some cases it is but it seems pretty wildly inconsistent. Compared to a direct X16 slot, it can be reduced by as little as 10-15%, to 15 and as much as 50%. But hey, maybe I haven't had the ideal eGPU experience. I'm going to hold on to this adapter so I can try it out on higher end systems in the future, and next week I'll have some data to share from a slightly less janky Thunderbolt dock with a previous gen mini PC. In the meantime, Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.